It's time to take a step beyond. The podcast to inspire creativity and imagination. Here's your host, Dr. Anthony Poston. Thanks for tuning in to A Step Beyond. If you've been listening to this podcast, then you know I'm a huge movie fan. And it's where I like to go to disengage from real life for a couple of hours and let myself get totally absorbed into a story. For some people, they read books. I like movies. Plus, watching a movie is faster. But we take a lot for granted in movies, especially the sound. If you don't believe me, then the next time you're at home watching a movie, turn down the volume and watch it in silence. It quickly loses its oomph and is quite boring. And it's often the little sounds, the background music, the creaking sounds of the staircase, or the boom when the door slams, or the tire screeching, the laser blast, whatever, that bring the movie to life. Because without them, it's just boring talk. Someone is responsible for giving a movie that life, and it's heartbeat, so to speak, and that someone is with us today. Our guest is a 16-time Oscar-nominated and Emmy Award-winning sound mixer. He's been doing this for over 40 years and has a resume that includes over 200 feature films and television credits. His film credits include Black Rain, The Rock, Con Air, Armageddon, The Mask of Zorro, The Patriot, Pearl Harbor, Spider-Man, Spider-Man 2, Memoirs of a Geisha, Apocalypto, the entire Transformers franchise, Salt, and Skyfall. You know, actually, it would take less time to just list off the movies he hasn't worked on. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the sound master himself, Mr. Greg Russell. Greg, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much, Tony. Uh, it's, a, it's a privilege to be here, and I, I thank you for the invitation. So before we get into all the details of your career and your success doing it, tell our listeners what exactly sound mixing is and take us through the process. Well, yeah, as you said, you know, when you turn the volume off, um, there's pretty much nothing, nothing there. When they shoot a film, the primary uh, uh, job of the production sound mixer, well, you, see a, you always see a boom microphone or a microphone near an actor, is primarily to record the dialogue of those scenes. And therefore, every sound, and you, and you uh, eloquently stated, um, is added after the fact. And from all the backgrounds to, you know, birds and crickets and, and traffic noise and just winds in general. And there's so many variations of, of backgrounds and ambiences that are added to support the locations where you are in every movie. Along with what we call hard effects, which you described as well, car screeches, gunshots, explosions, door closes, and so forth. And then there's also all what's called foley footsteps, and all the hand touching, everything in the scene um, are done by foley artists. That, that, and these are all sound elements that are created and and, and many are, are in libraries because people have done movies for a long time. They just pull from things they've done in the past. But all of those elements are brought to a sound mixing stage, and which is then, you know, and, and primarily the first discipline is the editorial of those sounds and putting them in sync. And then the balancing and panning uh, of those sounds, equalizing them, adding reverbs and all of that, then go to what's called the mixing process, which is what I and I inevitably do. So it's kind of a two-part series, building all of the elements, meaning all the ingredients that are going to create the meal, and then actually cooking and preparing the meal. Um, uh, so sound editing versus sound mixing, and so uh, and it's a very in, it's, it's a very exciting process because just as you said, um, the film isn't alive until all of these elements are put into the movie. And so for me, one of the most exciting aspects of it is watching a filmmaker who I know has been on this movie from writing the film, pre-production, through production into post-production two to three years and now watching this filmmaker's face when he sees a sequence with all of this incredible sound and all the music um, in in his movie um, and he's just you know super excited about you know finally 
this is his film. So yeah, the the film isn't really alive until all of these elements are put in and blended and mixed um, for then to have that real essence of this is what the movie is supposed to be. Okay, so you know? you, so so you're handed a movie project. How do you know where to get? How do you get your arms around it? I mean, how, how do you know where to start? In- well, I mean, again, it starts with the sound editorial team and sound designers, and they have libraries. Like I said, that the, the top people that I unfortunately get to work with have incredible resources because they've been stockpiling and archiving all of their material from for for the last twenty, twenty five, thirty years. And so they have, a, you know, an enormous, if they want any kind of car, many, of, many times they have most of what they need for a movie, but, but there's always the, hey, we, we specifically need to go out and record this 1938 whatever vehicle, um, or this particular airplane, or this particular helicopter, and they will do that. They will get, the, get that put in the budget so they can specifically record certain things for that movie. And then they prepare it and build it and build all of these tracks, all these ambiences, all of these hard effects, all of these Foley tracks, and then bring them to, you know, to the mix stage. Um, and so, so that's, you know, and, and again, it's a, it's a huge collaboration. You know, when you have um, the cra- you know, you, everyone has sat at the end of a movie and looked at a gazillion names. Film is probably the biggest collaborative art form on the planet because you have hundreds and hundreds of people on all these various disciplines that are all contributing to one thing, making a great movie. Sound is a very specialized aspect of that, and our sound teams are not huge. They used to be a lot bigger. Now they're much more condensed. So you have your, your skeleton crew that work hand-in-hand hand together, um, speaking and talking with the director about you know, his, his ideas and, and giving him options and so forth um, as you go through this process. And it's very, very gratifying because, again, um, you know, we are breathing life into a, into a kind of a still object. And, uh, and that heartbeat is, a, is an accurate term because it's alive when we finish. Okay, so I've seen video of you working, and you're at this like this 50-foot soundboard that's yeah. like massive, and I, which I can't imagine you touch all those buttons and knobs. But anyway, <laughs> and then you got this big video screen in front of you, so you're kind of watching the movie over and over and over and over again uh, to, to do this. Uh, how much time, on average, does it take to mix a movie? Well, it really depends on the complexity of the film. A straight walking, what we call a walk and talk, a straight kind of drama or um, just more more likely a, a dialogue-driven movie and not such a big action, you know, set-piece film. Um, it, you know, could take anywhere from, um, you know, four to six weeks to do and there, there are films that, you know, like a Transformer film, which are kind of, you know, from, from start to finish, from, from sound editing and design to final mix is almost a year. So, um, so that's, you know, so there's, and, and there's a wide range in between that. Uh, you know, so it really does vary. Now schedules are much, much more escalated now, and they, uh, they you know, budgets have been, um, you know, they're very <clears throat> condensed these days. And so they want a whole lot more for a whole lot less. And that's seemingly happening in every aspect of filmmaking. Um, so time, which is really the one commodity, the one resource that we need to be able to do the, the very best quality of work, um, has been dwindling, uh, to say the least. So we're trying to do all we can with what the resources we have, um, and I'm still, you know, a stickler on how do I make the best movie? How do I make each and every moment in a film have meaning and, and have a focus and, and a clarity about it so that, you know, people are satisfied throughout the film and not wondering, what did he say? What, what was that? What, what, what was, what, what did he say? You know, and I really, even on a big action movie, I really want to make sure that the story is the first and foremost um, component that we don't lose um, in 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 awe in and not lose it in awe of a huge special effects moment 
or or some big you know sound set piece. Um, we want to stay focused on the story, but um, but yeah, it's it it varies, you know. So it it, it can be it's, it's, we've I've mixed a movie in a week. They've I've I've had a situation where um, just recently uh, Janusz Kaminski, who is Steven Spielberg's um, uh, cinematographer, and I think he's nominated uh, he's nominated uh, for this year for the Post. Um, Janusz uh, directed a little movie, and Technicolor wanted to help him. And they said, you got five days to mix the whole movie. So I mixed it in five days. So, so, there, so it, it can go from that all the way to a, a very long process with a big movie like a Transformers. Okay, so how, how did you get started in this? Take us through your career a bit. Well, you know, my dad was a studio musician, um, and so I grew up uh, around music my whole life, and I, I spent quite a bit of time with him going to recording studios, and, and my dad, in fact, wanted me to be a musician and had me playing saxophone, and, 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 I, and I wasn't a fan uh, of that, and, and I really did was a much more rhythmical person. Um, so I started pounding on drums, and, and that was kind of my, my release as far as my musicianship. But really, I was, I was so uh, intrigued by the man on the other side of the glass, the man creating sounds and getting a, you know, a good drum sound and, and bass sound and guitars and trumpets. And, and, and that man fascinated me, and that's the recording engineer. So in essence, I, I, I was in high school, and my dad asked me, there's a, there's a, a renowned... A uh, recording engineer named Bill Lazarus, who has a class that he holds for producers, so that they can become better engineers. And you know, I could get you in this class. And heck, I was like 17 years old, or uh, maybe I was 16 even. And I said, sure, I'd love that. And I was sitting in this class in in uh, in in uh, Los Angeles, California, at this recording studio that my dad, you know, did a lot of work at, and. Uh, I was sitting there with a guy named, you know, one of the guys in the class was Louis Shelton, and he was the producer. And at the time, Seals and Croft was like the one of the biggest bands and uh, duos in, in music. And he was their producer. And, and I was sitting there with um, this amazing recording engineer who teaching the fundamentals. And I just, it was just kind of like a fish to water. I loved it. I couldn't get enough of it. I was given the opportunity to answer phones at that recording studio via the owner of the studio asked this engineer slash teacher, is there a young kid in your class that, that might you know be into this? And, and I jumped at the opportunity, and I was 17 years old and still in high school and answering phones at a recording studio that was doing you know record work and television and, and movie film scores and it was incredibly exciting. So um, I transitioned right from that. You know, that man gave me opportunity at a very young age that you just don't get. Now, mind you, he didn't pay me well, but I was just so excited to be in, in and around that environment. And so uh, I soaked everything up as, 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 as a sponge as a young kid and, and listened and, and watched everything everybody did. And uh, found myself, you know, becoming a, a, a setup man on the scoring stage at first and becoming a second engineer. And this was in 1977, 78, um, at, just out of high school now. And, uh, and then started uh, engineering my first few things at 19 years of age. Um, so I was hooked. Uh, I never saw t movies. I wanted to make records. But lo and behold, that's a very, um, uh, very challenging business to be in, especially in the time that I was entering it in the early 80s. Um, things were being done in home studios, and they were leaving the, the iconic recording studio environments. And um, in and about 1983, um, which was, uh, you know, I, I worked – well, actually, I worked from eight, 77 to 81 at this first facility, um, and then I just couldn't afford to stay there any longer because he just wasn't paying me, and I got an opportunity to move to Evergreen Recording Studios um, in, in Burbank, and I got in the union, and I started making the money I should have been making all along, and I did that for a couple of years there, and it was similar to the same work, 
television and motion picture scoring, music for those those films and TV projects, and record work. And uh, and yet in 1983, um, and truth be known, and I'll be really straight up honest with you, um, I found myself working with you know musicians, and and there were a lot of drugs, and there was a lot of um, insanity going on, and my personality, unfortunately, was one that uh, um, I took to that in in a way that um, you know I became a bit out of control and a, and a bit unreliable, and I lost a job at that studio at Evergreen Studios because of my unreliability, and it was all directly related to. Um, drug abuse um, and drinking and, and cocaine back in the early 80s and so forth. And in in May of 1984, and I had you know really a, a troubled type of career for about a year because I just wasn't getting work and my reputation had taken a few shots. Um, I went to a man who 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 got sober. And he knew who I was and, and, and what type of personality I was. And he reached out to me and said, if you ever need help, um, I'm here. Let me know. And, um, and there was a time I, I, I knew I needed help, uh, and I couldn't, I couldn't fix it myself. And I didn't know how to get out from under this. And, uh, and this man uh, brought me to um, Alcoholics Anonymous and also Cocaine Anonymous, uh, two 12 step programs. And but for the grace of God, May ninth, nineteen eighty four, I got sober. And um, and truth be known, it was the greatest gift, without question, next to the birth of my daughter, some many years later, that I've ever had in my life. Um, because from that moment, um, everything changed. My entire life changed. Um, the clarity by which I. I had in the focus I had in my life was comp- unlike anything I'd ever known before. And the willingness to be teachable was really, you know, it, it, it switched gears because the humility that I found in having to bottom out with drugs and alcohol, where I had to say, I can't do it by myself, I need help, brought that to a place where throughout my life from this point forward, if I don't understand something, I'm going to ask somebody who knows. And that tool has, has been probably the most significant switch of my, in my life that I can be, I, you know, I don't have to have all the answers. If I'm willing to ask someone who might, I might be able to learn. And that was a, a, a huge gift for me because I was a pretty arrogant um, putz, to say the least, um, with my ego and pride and etc. And the thing about bottoming out with that was that all of that goes away and I just want to live and I don't know how to do that by myself. And I asked those that, that had solved their problem how to get out from under it and they did. And so there, then my career just took off, Tony. Um, you know, I, and, and, I, and I can just run the entire pace of it, um, but if you want to interject or, or ask me any questions, feel free. But I, was, I, I got an opportunity to work at a post-production facility in 1983 called B&B Sound. And it was a little place that did mixing for television film. And that, now this is more of the dubbing and re-recording, which is the work that I do now, but on a very small scale. And they asked me to come there. And I got the job, and I uh, uh, and and they we were doing little television shows, and back then there was a show called Moonlighting with Bruce Willis and um, uh, Sybil Shepherd, and and I was working on that and some other miscellaneous things, and then we started to get uh, low budget feature films, and I was working with a with a guy Jeff Habush, who is still a very dear friend today, and we still we did the last Transformers together, so we've worked on and off for over thirty years. And so this is 1983 to 1988, and uh, Jeff and I mixed 55 small, low-budget features there um, uh, and, and uh, quite a bit of television. And then I got a call 
from uh, the head of post-production at Warner Brothers Studio, which was like getting a call if you were working, if you, if you were in the minor leagues in baseball, in triple-A ball, or single-A ball for that matter, and you get a call from the Los Angeles Dodgers um, that they'd like to come uh, meet with you, uh, and, and that's what that call was like, and, and I got... Uh, the opportunity to go to the big leagues. And my first movie there was uh, Tequila Sunrise, starring Mel Gibson and Michelle Pfeiffer and Kurt Russell. And it was, and it was very intimidating because the, the director of that movie was an Oscar-winning screenwriter, Robert Town, who wrote the screenplay for Chinatown. And uh, Claire Simpson was the film editor who just two years prior to that won the Oscar for editing Platoon. And it goes on and on. Everybody in that room were either Oscar winners or Oscar nominated people. And here I am, you know, now 29 years old and uh, pretty intimidated. Um, but I survived that and, uh, and literally a year later was given the opportunity to work uh, on a movie called Black Rain, uh, directed by Ridley Scott. And uh, and I, we, I was so excited to be a part of this movie, and and we finished this movie, and some and one of the other gentlemen who I was mixing with, who was I was mixing music on that movie, um, and the composer of that film was Hans Zimmer, who is nominated this year for Dunkirk, um, and he's been nominated many many years. And Hans was uh, I met him that was in 1989. Um, and, and he said, uh, this gentleman who I mixed it with said, you know, we have a chance of getting nominated for this movie. It's a really great sounding movie and people are talking about it. And I said, what, what, what are you talking about? And he says, yeah, no, it, it has a chance. And lo and behold, my phone rang five thirty in the morning and I wasn't even aware that it was nomination morning and my phone rang and it was him saying, you know, it actually was the guy who gave me my job at Warner Brothers, who was the chairman of the the Board of Governors, the sound branch at the Academy, and he has a voice that's very resonant, and he says, Greg, Greg, I just is Don Rogers down at the Academy. I just wanted to congratulate you on your on your first Academy Award nomination. And I I was in shock. I was like, What? And uh and it was it was probably one of the most thrilling experiences um, of my life. Um, I was completely blown away, and, and lo and behold, um, it was the beginning of many of those to come uh, in the future. So that's how it all really started. And I spent from 1988 to 1995 at Warner Brothers, and I wasn't nominated again at Warner Brothers, uh, you know, of uh, you know that was really my one and only nomination at Warner Brothers and in 1995 and 96 the very first year I moved to Sony Studios um I did a movie called The Rock uh directed by Michael Bay starring Sean Connery and Nicolas Cage and Ed Harris and that movie got nominated and then the year after that I did a film called Con Air you know, with Nick Cage, and that movie got nominated, so that's two years in a row. And the following year, we were nominated for two movies, uh, Armageddon and The Mask of Zorro. So that was in 90, uh, 98. Um, uh, so it was pretty incredible, the kind of run that started to happen for me. And uh, I, I, I felt so blessed and such an honor to be able to be a part of um, these types, these these caliber of films, and with these caliber of talent, that was a part of it. And I and I worked hand in hand with a mixer uh, for many years, Kevin O'Connell. And Kevin O'Connell actually ha held the record last year for the most nominated, you know, uh, most most nominated human being without having won, and he had 20 nominations, and Kevin won last year for Hacksaw Ridge, and I couldn't have been more thrilled for him. And now, un un unbeknownst to me, I have the dubious honor now of carrying that same torch of 16 nominations without a win, but, but I'll, I'll get, to, I'll okay, get there hey, one of these days. <laughs> but, but you know what? Being honored, I mean, being nominated is a huge honor in and of itself. But I also know that the process for picking winners is somewhat flawed. I mean, you and I talked about this in the past, and, and I don't want anybody to think you will harbor any negative feelings about it because I know you don't. And, yeah, I don't. Because and, and, yeah. and, 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 it was actually the people who know sound that nominated you. 
But explain Correct. explain to us the process as to why it's flawed, um, especially for people in specific and technical categories. Well, I mean, in my opinion, and it's the opinion of many that you know, I, um, you, you said it right. You know, the nomination comes from the individual branch, meaning the sound people nominate sound mixing and sound editing. Cinematographers nominate cinematographers. Art directors nominate because they know that discipline better than anybody. And um, and so you really do get a selection of five very high quality films in every category. Um, and so I have no issue with that. But what happens is the sound branch has maybe 480 members and the cinematographers uh, have maybe 300 members. And, and, and when we get a ballot like I just sent in two days ago because they were due just yesterday, um, for the actual win, we are now voting on every category. And I'm sitting here, you know, um, voting on art direction and cinematography and makeup, and I truly am not the expert in, in any of those categories. So, and, and the same with other people with sound. So, unfortunately... The, the what usually happens is if there's a very you know highly populated uh, you know popular show or was the one movie that is critically acclaimed and ends up winning best picture and director and etc may not necessarily be the best sound job of the year but it will more than likely win because people just start voting for what they might call their favorite movie of that year and that is happens you know frequently and um and there are too many examples of what should have won and uh what and then what did win and uh so you know and that goes across the board you know for every discipline it's not just about sound so i mean there are other organizations that basically stay consistent with let the nominating committee, meaning the branch, nominate, and let them also choose what they feel is the best work in their category. And I think if it were that way, truly, I think you'd get a best, the best representation of, of the best work in each discipline. And, uh, and so that's, that's how I see it. But when, because it's going now, you have to understand, there's over 7,000 members of the Academy and if you're thinking of sound and there's 400 and some odd people that may really know the the best of what's of you know of those five films but now you've got 6600 people that might not know sound all that well or let's just take it let's say 1600 of them really do but there's 5000 that don't well, you know, because I know that Transformers you're nominated for was a, is, is a very, when it comes to sound, it's an incredible movie. But Transformers isn't going to resonate with a lot of people because if you're, if you're older and you're not into that kind of thing, you, you, yeah. you, you probably yeah. wouldn't watch I mean, it. Tr- tr- truth is, on, in 2007, you know, we were, we were written up in every article about the, you know, in, as well as the visual effects team, as the truly groundbreaking movie of the year for both, both sound and visual effects. And yet, you're right. There are probably 80% of the Academy never bothered even watching a Transformer movie, a robot movie directed by Michael Bay, which is a popcorn summer type movie um, that just didn't get, you know, uh, wasn't even viewed. So, so, you know, here we are thinking we, we have the best chance ever, but in the end, we didn't because, you know, it just was not, you know, it wasn't looked at. So, I mean, and that's just, again, you know, and I don't have the sense of sour grapes, and it's disappointing to lose, don't get me wrong, especially going there that many times. You think, my God, at some point, we've got to be the, we got to come out on top. And, and, for, and that's why I was so excited for Kevin last year, because it finally happened for him. He finally was on the right movie. And uh, I couldn't have been more thrilled. And, and at some point, it'll be my time as well. I, I certainly have been incredibly gracious to everyone who has won while I've been there. And because it's their moment. In, and I really want them to feel it, 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 that exhilaration. And I don't want them to feel any negativity that I'm bummed out. And uh, so I, I, I do. I, 
I want people to enjoy that. That's their moment in time, and it's fabulous. And I've seen many people enjoy that ride, and it looks pretty damn incredible, I can tell you that. Well, you know, when I look at what you do every day, it, it does look really fun. I mean, for example, I know that Indiana Jones made a huge impact on you. And, you know, when, when I read that, I'm like, huh. So last weekend I watched it again and for the first time in probably, I don't know, 10 years. Right. And, uh, but this time I, I watched it differently because this time I consciously pay attention to the sound in that movie. And, and, and it was intense. I mean, I mean, I, I just took it for granted when I watched it last time, but, but you know, the first time. But when I watched it last time, trying to listen to sound, it made a big difference for me in that movie. So, well, I mean, how, how could you not look forward every morning to, get out, to get, getting out of bed and just going to watch movies and be creative? Yeah, I, it, it's, it's, a, it's a true blessing, you know. I mean, I, I think as I've, as I've really tried to illustrate to my 15-year-old daughter who, you know, what a gift it has been for over 40 years now to be excited to go to work and 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 don't get me wrong there's a stress level to the to the work that we do and the schedules that we have that can be very challenging but the the creative process in collaborating with such highly talented people and being a part of that team is uh is it, it, it's truly exhilarating and and I and I couldn't be more grateful to be able to they say if you love what you do you never have to work a day in your life and and it really is that 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 it's a, there's so much truth to that I don't dread going to work and and uh and and all of what I've heard many people in other aspects of of uh, other 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 lines of work that um, I, I've been, uh, it's like being in a kid in a candy store. And I, and I felt that way from day one working in that very first recording studio I spoke of to, to this very day now, um, you know, going in and, and doing the things that I'm doing today. So, uh, it's, it's pretty, I'm just older, <laughs> I'm older, I'm grayer. Uh, but my enthusiasm and my passion, um, to create, uh, an exhilarating, dynamic, and exciting soundtrack to a motion picture has not lessened. In fact, you know, look, having done over 200 movies, I've gotten to, to play in the sandbox of sound a long time, and um, and 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 it's just been, you know, uh, a, a true joy. I want to touch on that what you just said to me because it's relevant for this weekend. Because I want, I don't know if people are going to hear this before the Academy Awards, but. The Raiders of the Lost Ark, and I sent a message to a man um, who was inspirational because he was the one who mixed the sound effects to that movie. Um, and that movie won the Academy Award in 1980, I believe. And, uh, and his name is Greg Landaker. And uh, because I was only doing music uh, at that time and wasn't involved in film, and it was the first time I listened to a soundtrack, listening to all the sounds panning around the room and going around my head and the low-end, low-frequency subwoofer of the ball rolling right at you and over your head. And I was so astounded by that. It, it, it was really the first light bulb moment for me to think, wow, somebody's doing that. Someone's manipulating all of these sounds like this. And if I ever had the opportunity to work in film like that, I would jump at the opportunity. Now, I never dreamed that I would get that, really, truly get that opportunity. And I certainly do it at the level I've been able to do it at all my career now. But that man um, retired this year, and his last movie on record that he will be doing um, was Dunkirk, and he is nominated this year. I think it's his eighth nomination. Um, it's his. I think it's his eighth nomination. He has won three Oscars. He won for Raiders of the Lost Ark. He won the following year back-to-back -back Oscars with Empire Strikes Back, and uh, or they might have been flipped. I think maybe Empires then Raiders, but I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, and uh, and then he won once again in '94 for Speed, and and he has a chance of going out and finishing his career with a grand total of four Academy Awards. I think he's going to win it. He's in all of the predictions. He's won the BAFTA. Um, he won the CAS Cinema Audio Society Award just last weekend with Dunkirk. So he's postured to to bring home the the, the Oscar this year. And, and and what a fitting way to end uh, an an incredible career, but he was very instrumental and in, an inspiration.
emotional to me to even think about that aspect of mixing um, really for the very first time uh, in my life. So um, kudos to Greg Landaker and congratulations. And if, and, and if people do get to hear this um, prior to Sunday, um, be watching for him to be on stage with his fourth and final uh, Academy Award. Uh, you know, I'm, I want to touch on something you talked about earlier. I've written many times that practice makes permanent, not perfect, that we should always be striving towards perfection every day by making little incremental improvements to what we do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you've been doing this a very long time. How do you how do you push yourself, and, and, and what do you do to become more to be to, to exhibit higher levels of creativity and become better at it? Um, I I think always keep an open mind. Um, uh, when I think I know there's only one way to do something, I'm in trouble because I'm closing myself off to really what the possibility might be, and I'm not even seeing it. Because and, and it can be a double-edged sword, that kind of experience. You think you can go right to the, the one and only way to do something, but there is never one and only way to do anything. And, um, and, so, and, and I listen to my collaborators uh, because, you know, again, there's nuance to things that, you, you know, you get ideas and you get inspired and, and it can be a thought. And, um, you know, so keeping my mind open to anything that's going on in the room, anything that other people are saying, um, and, and my own intuition, just allowing it to breathe. Because sometimes I'm so fast at what I'm doing because I am fast at it. I am quick to get to a place where people are going, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, that sounds great. But, you know, I also want to take a moment to go to reflect on it and go, well, it's good, but what if we tried this? Now, the only thing, and I said this earlier on, was that our, our greatest, um, uh, you know, commodity to create the very best work possible is time. And, the, and we're getting less of that. And so the playfulness that we have with what the potential of something can be really takes a huge hit by, I got to get it done. I got to get it done. Okay, we need to be done by this reel, by this time, and tomorrow we need to be here. And, and all of these, these restrictive measures um, within our schedule have made it challenging to, to play in that sandbox that I spoke of and, and experiment. So your instincts have to you know, be true. But again, I think it's really staying as fresh as possible and not just uh, in, in looking at every opportunity as something very specific and very new and not just do what I did two films ago on this very thing. And I think they'll dig it because it worked there. It'll work here is to try to be fresh and look at everything as a as a as kind of a blank canvas, and um, and build it, you know, with whatever in, inspiration that you find in that given moment with everybody that you're that you're enveloped with. You know, you've worked with a lot of incredible directors over the years: Ron Howard, uh, Michael Bay, Tony and Ridley Scott, Sam Mendes, Tim Burton, Mel Gibson, Rob Reiner, many, many, many more. Uh, but you have a special relationship with Michael Bay, I think, and. You've worked with him on many films. In fact, I think yeah. I think Transformers: Dark Side of the Moon was Paramount Pictures' first billion-dollar grossing movie in its hundred years of existence. Yeah. Uh, explain explain how Michael Bay brings out your creative best. He Michael Bay is you know we've been together. This is going on twenty two years now from The Rock that was in nineteen ninety six and we're in two thousand eighteen. So um, so we're, we're we've been together over twenty twenty two years now. Um, He brings out the best of me because, truth be known, Michael's films are the most challenging visual effects spectacles of any filmmaker. Um, And there are others that I work with that do similar work, like Roland Emmerich and, you know, people, you know, like that, and Sam Raimi on the Spider-Mans. But Michael, the, the... his, he's such a visionary, and I mean, I'll even give you an example. I'll be working on a scene, and I'll be so blown away by what these robots are doing and how they're doing them and how believable these images look, and I will pick up the phone and I'll call them and, th- and say, how the hell did you do this? this? I mean, this looks so insanely cool 
that it's it's mind blowing. He will get he he would always get excited about you know my enthusiasm for what he did because that's what inspires me. It's like how do we bring that to life? That's a seventy foot robot going fighting at sixty miles an hour on a freeway slashing through a bus. How do we even do that? You know, so to to have a filmmaker that presses. Um, and raises the bar continually, film after film after film. Because I'm telling you, from The Rock to Armageddon to Pearl Harbor to a, to the to even the Bad Boys, you know, as far as action, um, and a, even a movie that was understated was a, one the one movie that like did not do really really well, like most of his movies have done, was a movie called The Island. And if you watch that movie. I guarantee you, you will be entertained. It was actually a really good film. And again, a visual spectacle of what was going on. And then, you know, then there's nothing quite like the Transformer franchise. So, you know, um, he, he raises the bar each and every time. You need to match his intensity. And, I, and, and he has made me, and I've said this in many interviews, um, I'm a better mixer because of Michael Bay. You know, I mean, the challenges that he has been put before us and my entire team um, have always, you know, made us scratch our head and go, okay, back to the drawing board, man. We've got to figure out how to do this and, and do it well and make it believable and make it real. And, you know, some of these images are so extraordinary to make them believable and real for an audience is really a huge challenge, and that is why I think you know he is he has motivated me and 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 brought about the very best in my ability uh, to continually you know reach higher and higher every time. You know, you, you mentioned Star Wars: uh, Empire Strikes Back before, and I've always been interested in how sounds are created because you know you mentioned before about recording things. Well, not everything exists, so you got to fabricate and make it up some, at some point, like a like, like a laser blast. Well, I, I know on Star Wars, I saw a documentary once where they showed how they did that. Some guy went out with a pipe, I think, and wrapped on a guide wire for a telephone pole. Yeah, and it made that, that was, and it made yeah. that sound. So they recorded that, it. That was Ben Burton, and Ben Burton was is one of the all time greatest sound designers um of our of our of our era and uh and and there are there are many and graduating from him was up there at skywalker was gary reitstrom who did all the you know um you know the jurassic park you know um dinosaurs and and all of that and who's done incredible incredible work and and then you know chris boys has taken that and and Randy Tom, these are all guys that are up in Skywalker. But then there are incredible people down here, and the people that do uh, the Transformer, um, you know, work is uh, Ethan Vanderine and Eric Adol, incredibly talented guys, and their team. Um, so they're they're just special special artists that find. Uh, I'll you know, give you an example of a similar scenario. You know, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, the, you know, the, some of the big. Robot uh, uh, Optimus Prime, you know, uh, Optimus Prime's footstep is actually, you know, built from a um, my the sound designer Eric Adol recorded um, his his dryer door slamming shut, and it just made this kind of sound of which he then pitched that down, and that really is the origin of you know Optimus Prime's footstep you know, is a drier door, you know. So there are, there are always those kinds of things that are very interesting, and, and they're always fun for audiences to see just how and what created certain sounds, and uh, it, it really is a, a, a fabulous uh, a gift that, that they have to find a way to create the unimaginable. Yeah, stuff you'd never think about, and and, yeah. I want, and I want to thank you too because you know I I know that you got Eric Adol to do my music for my book trailer. Uh, yes. that's, that's on my website. So I feel yes. pretty I feel pretty honored to get one of the best Hollywood sound designers to do some music for our book trailer for me. It's pretty cool. You, you certainly did, and he was a, a real he's a real gentleman, and and I, I, I he's like a brother to me, and and uh, you know we've we've done a lot of things together. I was happy he was able to help you out on that for sure. Yeah, me too. I, I appreciate that. Hey, what film are you most proud of? Of all the films you've worked on, what's what, if you had to pick one, what would it be? Gosh, you know. Uh, I, I, I just wrote a letter to Roland Emmerich um, just last night, 
um, and because he's doing a few things that I wanted to talk with him about, and I haven't worked with him in a while. And one of my favorite movies is uh, was starring Mel Gibson. It was called The Patriot, and Mel Gibson loses two of his sons to this very, very evil um, British soldier um, commander. And if you haven't seen The Patriot, we did it, and I think it was. 2000 and we were nominated for sound and sound uh sound and uh john williams was was nominated for the score which is beautiful and the cinematography was nominated as well uh, caleb de chanel was nominated so it's a beautiful looking movie sounding movie and it's just i just found it to be one of my favorite films and i just wrote him a message to that last night so that would be very high on my list and and uh, I'm proud of Skyfall, of course. It was an honor to be a part of a James Bond movie. I've been a fan my whole life, so that was a thrill. I think the very first Spider-Man is a wonderful... It's hard for me to give it to one movie, Tony. Uh, oh, I get um, it, I get it. <laughs> you know, it just is. I mean, Sam Raimi's a special, special filmmaker, and, and I, I I thoroughly enjoyed being a part of the first three that he directed. And, and uh, so... There, there, there are quite a few, and 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 you know, it's 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 been a privilege to get to work with such incredible and talented people. You know, it uh, it, it really is an honor. But Michael Bay, still, you know, um, The Rock and Armageddon are two favorite movies of mine. Um, uh, and uh, it, it's it's just uh, I love movies that take me on an incredible journey. You know. And like you said early on in setting up this piece, you know, two hours to spend, you know, on a story and on a kind of an adventure that can take you out of the realm of your own, you know, I'm not going to say mundane, but whatever our life issues are and the challenges that we have, it's an incredible escape to be able to sit in a movie theater and go on, go to a place you've never been and experience characters you've never known. And, and to be a part of that is, in, is just a real privilege and an honor, and I'm so grateful to, to, to get to do what I do for a living. I really, really am. Well, I, I envy you, my friend. So, hey, we're going to do a lightning round here quick. I uh, I do a lot of either-or questions for all of my guests. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it two things, either-or. You pick the first one you resonate with, all right? Sure. All right, phone call or text? Um, phone call. Sunrise or sunset? Uh, sunset. Television show or movie? Duh. Movie. <laughs> Facebook or Twitter? Uh, Facebook. Toilet paper, over or under? Uh, over, always. Grilled or pan-fried? Uh, grilled. High tech or low tech? High tech. Nickelback or the Stones? Um, the Stones. Call of Duty or Pac Man? Call of Duty. Sweet or salty? Um, sweet. Last but not least, Star Trek or Star Wars? Uh, I have to go Star Wars. Oh my gosh, people! Yeah. All right, yeah, hey, yeah. Greg, thank you, my friend. Um, hey, I know you're a super busy guy, and I totally appreciate your willingness to do this today. Let me let me end the show by asking you this. What would you say to a young person who would like to do what you are doing now? Well, uh, I would I would say it, this, this workflow now is coming through from a sound editing and design platform now because sound editors are now mixing because of the tools available to them with Pro Tools, et cetera, that I think you'd need to find a post-production um, sound design, sound editorial company to intern for. Um, I would say you'd need classes and you'd need, you'd need to know Pro Tools very well because that is the platform of which all sound editing, design, and mixing is all engulfed in at this time. And I don't see that changing. So, and be willing to do anything, any job, anywhere for the experience and just to be a part of whatever is within that creative process. Because like I said early on, just to be in the room, just to be in the room is something to never take for granted because you can learn so much by just watching, listening to those that are good or great at what they do because I truly uh, aspire to my talent and my ability um, is is one thing, but the, the privilege I had getting to sit next to some of the greatest people that do this work 
and learn from them has been all inspiring in all of itself. So the ever uh, ever given the opportunity to watch somebody or 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 you know in in any capacity jump on the opportunity. So that's that's what I would probably say. Yeah. I, I would agree with your brother. I mean, I tell people all the time, if you want something bad enough, you will do whatever you have to do to get your foot in the door. Exactly. Hey, thanks, Greg. I appreciate it. And thank all of you for listening and taking a step beyond with us. Hey, Greg is right. If you love what you do for a living, you will never work a day in your life. And this principle definitely defines Greg. We should all be striving to do what we love to do so we can exhibit the high level of passion and energy necessary to work hard and be awesome at it. I hope you'll continue to listen to A Step Beyond and become inspired to be the very best version of yourself. I'm your host, Anthony Postian. Follow your dreams. Thanks for listening to A Step Beyond. Take a moment, if you would, and leave a review on iTunes and share the podcast with those who need to be inspired to become more creative and imaginative in everything they do.